Drew, welcome to the Sharpening Strength Podcast. So stoked to have you on here, man. This is going to be a lot of fun today. Thanks, Dave. Um, uh, it's been a, a pleasure to know you and a pleasure to be on uh, this podcast you started. Yeah, so I'm excited. Let's, uh, let's start, though, by giving listeners just a, a general overview of your background, so both personally and professionally, to give, a, give them an idea of, of your background, where you're coming from. Yeah, I think the best thing is, is having some context. So um, I think it really started in my childhood. Uh, my, my grandmother, so my dad's mom, she had an early, the, like one of the worst cases of rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, she was uh, crippled at 30, 30 years old. Uh, so my dad growing up, seeing that, uh, and also seeing what the medical establishment does with, you know, especially at that time, there's not, you know, uh, functional medicine and they're not looking for integrative, you know, healthy. So it's just medications and things like that. So we got really into looking at, you know, what's causing some of this stuff. Um, and early on, he got her to get off of medication, you know, start to clean up her diet. And that kind of brought him into the nutrition front. And this is back in the seventies, you know, and he kind of tagged in with uh, somebody else. Um, he, his view was psychology in a sense. So he was looking at that. He actually, they teamed up with a chiropractor, um, and somebody else that went on to kind of start their own nutrition company. Um, but that early on, you know, that kind of stemmed into me as a kid, they're implementing those things. And that's kind of just like wisdom. You know, I feel that that's one thing that we are lacking today is that wisdom piece of, you know, me as a parent, I'm not just going to let my kid, you know, eat or drink this because whatever, you know, I know I, don't, I have a puppy right now. I'm not going to do that with my puppy. There's a really strict diet. And again, there should be some wiggle room, but you know, growing up, I had some strict guidelines with nutrition, you know, and I, as a kid, you don't want to go through that kind of stuff. You know, it's kind of, <laughs> do I need to eat, you know, you know, back in, you know, when I was a kid, rice milk back in the eighties and nineties, it was pretty much like, you know, chalky water. So it really wasn't, uh, you know, too appetizing. Um, but looking back, that really stemmed and, and kind of changed because there's discipline with that too. It's brought me into a discipline piece that, you know, now that I can see where my clients are lacking, you know, so it's really started to transform kind of how I look through my years of coaching now, you know, and I've been coaching for almost uh, 15 years now. Um, so that, that kind of, you know, I was an athlete as a kid, I remember getting my own weight room, weight stack at 14, you know, and I was the one that started weightlifting, you know, um, then when I went to freshman year of high school, that was just kind of a compliment, like, all right, I've been already trying to train. And, and that was looking back at I was, I was geared toward the physique, you know, that was the 80s and 90s of Stallone and Van Dam and, you know, Arnold, even, you know, um, and I was kind of, you know, intrigued by that. So that kind of started that. Um, you know, played high school, college sports, a little semi-pro baseball, and then kind of um, went back to school um, and got yeah, my degree in kinesiology, exercise phys. Started training in, you know, so actually training people in college, and then got out. And that's really when the big gym started to hit. So Lifetime Fitness uh, really opened up, and you know, it's a huge, 170,000 square foot facility, um, and you're just in front of so many people. Um, and that was a big, you know, did I know exactly what I was doing then? No. Uh, but I think that's the biggest thing is a lot of people get degrees, certifications, and they don't get in front of people and they don't put the time in and look at all that kind of stuff. And they just think, hey, okay, I, I'm a professional now because I have that. It's a grooming process over a course of years, you know. Um, and to be any professional, if you take a professional baseball player, you're they go to the minors and have to spend minors maybe to get to a professional standpoint to actually make it to the big leagues. Um, and that's the same thing with any other profession. And for some reason, trainers think that they can just jump into the role um, and do that. Um, and then from that experience, going into the private, um, more private sector in a, a kind of boutique, um, small, but working with the, kind of the who's who in, in downtown Chicago um, and really taking, we have to take our level up because at that time, training started to become, um, we have all these small, you know, um, gyms and, and studios popping up. It was becoming more of a trend then. Uh, so we can't just give workouts anymore. We had to actually give, um, and most of our clients too are injured. You know, majority of people are, they're going to physical therapy. Um, they're, they're broken. They have some type of ache and pain. So I can't just deal with that because if they do, and if I can't address it, then I'm out of my client. I can't, I can't train that person. So now I have to look at limitations and keep it 
and now give them value. And so they could keep on coming back. Even if they're going to physical therapy, we could still be training, you know, um, and that happens across the board. So really taking that, you know, then I started directing our education. We had about 25 coaches um, starting our small group training. That's really when Orange Theory came in and, and some of those other things. So we had to give another price point. You know, that was a big part is, is price point, but also giving high value. So people came in and they're like, hey, we're still, you know, learning, but in a group setting. You know, we're not just going out and be like, hey, here's a squat, you know, and whatever it looks like for you, that's what it is. It's like, nope, we have to kind of get better, um, you know, better coaching. And I really tried to change the word from trainer. And I really hate the word personal trainer because a personal trainer is basically somebody coming in. They just want to get fit. Um, so I'm going to just gonna take you where you're at and your squat is your squat. You're, and I'm just going to give you reps and, and numbers and I'm going to be a motivator and I'm just going to get you where a coach is actually going to work alongside with you. Um, and if you don't have good mechanics, then we're going to work on your mechanics, just like anything. Like if I, you were a basketball coach, I'm not going to take whatever somebody's level at. I'm trying to bring them up to a higher level. Um, and that's going to transform every part of that person's life in so many ways. And then from there, I've kind of went into, uh, I work with a ther uh, physical therapy place uh, currently, and then I do my own, um, you know, side training, um, and kind of my own, own day on the side, but it's been, uh, you know, just years of complexity of, uh, of different clientele, different environments, uh, own personal, you know, I've, I have a story of my own self and, you know, going through uh, pain and injuries, um, and not knowing, not being, you know, kind of an ego thing and going back to the, the bodybuilding Stallone, you know, worried about physique more so than, um, actually, you know, function. Um, so that's been a, and then now I can, you know, now I have a story now I have, you know, and that builds, you know, more knowledge too. And then hopefully your, your wisdom grows from that. And that's key. So sorry for being long winded, but no, it's, it's great. And I, I think a, a couple of cool things that stand out just listening to you talk is the, the experience piece, both as a coach, if you talk about not just gathering up certifications and trainers, I think that's for any coaches, trainers listening, there's a lot of people out there that they accumulate all these letters behind their name. They accumulate all these things. And we ran into it all the time with uh, fellow PT peers and, and people that just assumed they got out and we have this doctorate level of education. And that just meant we were better than a lot of the other trainers out there because we have a higher degree when started a lot of the people I've learned from have been good trainers and coaches and, and people that uh, are pushing their knowledge and applying it and, learning in real time versus just just gathering degrees and then i think that relates to with your personal story like you said of being being hurt and having to work through these things and uh, figure out what what actually works not what a textbook says works but what what actually feels the best for your body and how do you apply that to to other people with that with that injury and you're not to go too deep on it i guess but the kind of injury background is that where you felt a shift from physique to more the function that you're training for now yeah. So, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, when you, when you worry about physique, a lot of times you're playing within just short ranges. You know, if I'm trying to build my bicep, I'm trying to work on, you know, you know, full, um, in range, I'm trying to like get a pump, you know, it's the same thing with any type of thing. same with legs. Um, you know, but then all of a sudden you're like, you get, you know, years in and depending on your knowledge or your ego, all of a sudden some limitations start to happen and man, you know, so I have small kids. I, I want to play with my kids at their level. I got to learn how to deep squat and it's got to feel good because I got to spend some time down there. So it's not just getting down there, but like, Hey, if I can't spend five, 10 minutes, you know, playing with my kid in a deep squat man, there's a limitation there, you know, and I should be able to do both. And it's one time, sometimes our direction is just directly or focused on one thing and we should have a, a bigger spectrum, you know? Um, and again, we're going to have ups and downs. We're going to have, um, different goals along the way, you know, sometimes, but you know, I, I, I don't neglect that because I have a story now and now I have a, that's built knowledge, you know, and because there's a lot of people are doing the same thing that I did, you know, so now I can help them because, you know, or encourage them because of what I've gone through. Um, and if I knew what I know now, it would be a whole different thing, you know? Um, and again, we, we can't fault that again, any mistake or any pain is actually, that's a learning process. Um, so it's being, I guess, mature enough to know that, Hey, I've, I've, I've learned from that, um, whatever it was. Yeah. We, we've talked about this separately, but there's, there's a lot of 
looking back and be like, Oh, I wish I would have known, like if I would have known this 10 years ago, I would have been so much of a better athlete. And I would have like going through college, if I would have focused on this, instead of just trying to push a number, then, then this would have happened. But at the same time, those led to our own injuries and aches and things that we can relate so well to the people we're working with now, if we had it perfectly figured out and we never went through any setbacks and experienced any of these injuries or anything, then we're going to be really hard to relate to people that are coming in with aches and pains and, and both on the psychological level, like we we've talked about. And then also physically though, of how do we know what other stretches and things it's like, well, this should work. Cause this worked for me. And I think that's sometimes where people can be athletic and have an athletic background, but not be good coaches. If they, if they don't piece together both those sides of the story. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. You know, I, I look back and, you know, some things are, could be driven from other people. So it's not just me, um, you know, objectively, you know, looking at somebody doing exercise, but actually being coached, you know, going through a, you know, a high school strength program, how many of those back, you know, in the nineties were really good programs, you know, and it's like the, the similar cues, you know, I had a, I have, you know, I had a scoliosis when I was a kid in my spine and you go to a weight room and the coach tells you to look up and squat. So you're going into, you know, so depending on, you know, some of those limitations, um, you know, you're not doing, you know, you're not working on hip extension. You're not working on good core control. Um, you're just taking a bar on your back, which gives zero feedback. It's basically placing load on your spine. And then you, <laughs> you know, you look up and try to extend your spine and that's going to get you something, you know, and then from high school years forward, dealing with, with back issues, you know, um, and it's kind of a combination of all that kind of stuff. And then now, you know, I, I hate to say it because, you know, if you've ever dealt with back pain, um, it's, it's, it's horrible, but knock on wood, I haven't had back in, in, you know, a couple of years now. Um, but it's some things that I've learned along the way. And again, uh, the maturity of, you know, once you kind of get that and see the light, you don't go back, you know, cause it's so easy to kind of like, all right, I'm in a good place. I've gone, you know, I've really changed a little mindset and it's easy to kind of dabble back to what we're used to. Um, but I, I felt that I've cut some veins out and I'm in a whole different, you know, different place. Yeah. So cool. And, and this is a perfect transition into the heart of what we want to be talking about today too. And this overarching theme of maturity and uh, having some more movement discipline and definitions and some of these things. Cause when we were bouncing around some ideas of what to talk about it, we had a lot of things that were exciting, but we kept coming back to this, this root problem that was beneath it all. And it was that in the fitness world today, we're severely lacking in proper definitions of movement and movement literacy as well, as we'll call it and get into here today. But the, the problem is that people are performing things like what they say is a push up, a squat, a plank. They're doing these, these common movements that majority of people are familiar with, but there's no definition around what that really is. So they're performing things that look like a push up or look like a squat, or like we talked about earlier, without the standards of what the movement is, they're going through the motions of what is movement, but are they really accomplishing what these core movements, these foundational movements are supposed to do in terms of muscles working and what's going on in our joints and what's going on in our body. So uh, I think before we get into why this, isn't, why this is so important for, for the people listening, can you just give a general overview of what it means to you for the importance of having a proper definition around, around some of these movements and, and what the problem is if, if we don't. Yeah. So I think everything in life has a proper definition. If I go to work, you know, ideally most, most jobs have, you know, I have to complete a task and the task has to be, you know, there's guidelines that have to follow that task. If I don't follow those guidelines, then the job is not completed. Um, and when I have that, then I actually is I'm successful and I can continue to build off that. But if I never complete the job, then I can't go on to the next, next task or the next client or anything like that. Um, so that's the, that's the first part is having, you know, an, an objective and having a goal. Um, but at that point we have to start to, um, establish, um, kind of where we want to go in the long term. You know, we can't, we can't just, uh, um, look at the short term. Uh, we have to look at, at the long term and what do we want to be at, in five years, 10 years at the end of our life. You know, if I don't express, um, you know, a good, good squatting mechanic now, and if that leads down the road, then a nursing home gets closer. I hate to say that, 
I have clients that come in that are seven years old um, and I say that exact thing to them, not to basically offend them, not to get, you know, and sometimes they get angry with me. They're like, you can't tell me that. And I go, yes, because I'm trying to help you. If you don't understand your situation, then it's going to be bad. And that's why you typically go to a nursing home because you can't do a simple task. You can't get up and down from a, a toilet. You can't get up and down from a chair. Uh, if you go to other countries, a lot of times they assess that. You go to South America, they assess you getting up and down from the ground. That's part of a, a physical screen because uh, your mortality rate depends on it. You know, um, so that that's in, that's important to understand kind of that that long term. But then coming back to it, and then what am I actually dealing with? Um, you know, if I'm coming in and if I don't have a good definition of it, and if I've been in pain. Now I have all this variance. You know, if I default into a bad position and I just perceive that as a squat, well, that's bad. Now, if I'm healthy and if I can go into that bad position, well, that's fine. Our body has many ways, complexity of movement uh, and things like that. Uh, but as a coach, now I have, I, that allows me standards, you know. So, uh, you know, to get to a push-up, a plank is basically very, it's a basic exercise. But for most people, they don't understand the mechanics, you know, and I think, you know, for those, uh, even trainers, um, but understand the mechanics, the, the whole body is in this process. So a lot of people are not ready for a plank uh, because they don't, they've never given themselves feedback. So, you know, you need to start on the floor on your back. So now the floor is actually feedback. I can learn how to build pressure into the floor with my abdominals. I can learn how to tilt my pelvis, squeeze my glutes, um, and then start to ramp some tension up from there. Um, you know, and I don't want to, you know, I'll let you chime in because I don't want to keep on talking right now, but I think that's understanding, um, of the long term, as well as then where we want to go. So if I want to get really good pushups, then I have to break it down. And what I see in that pushup or the farthest position of pushup, maybe not just a pushup, but if I'm dealing with a male client, what is, are they getting better at a one arm pushup? Okay. Um, and that doesn't mean that they're going to a one-arm push-up. There's all these progressions in between there. And, you know, maybe their practice and their time a week, maybe they'll only get to this progression. Maybe it's a little bit farther than a regular push-up, but they're going to be in a stronger place. That's, uh, you know, and that will apply more so because it's about neuro, your neural demand. You know, we, we forgot about the three major basic things when it comes to training. The first is nervous system, okay? We have to get neurally set up, okay? And that's why a baby can walk within a year after coming out of the womb and almost being paralyzed. You know, they're, they're, they're pretty much, you know, Gumby. And then they, and they're setting up their nervous system. That's the key thing. From that point, it's connective tissue. And then as they mature, it's muscle. And in the training world, we've reversed that. <laughs> it, it goes first, it, oh, I got to train, and they go right to muscle. And, and that's what leads then to the lack of connective tissue and not good movement patterns, which is that nervous system as well as, and we touch a little bit on volume switch. Their nervous system doesn't know how to dial in. And if I want to engage my lats, my abs, and my glutes all at the one time, have I trained that process? And we, and typically we don't, we just, we're worried about just the movement or just training the muscles. And we haven't, you know, I use the analogy of a generator. Okay. My nervous system, my neural load, my central nervous system is like electrical impulses through my body. So if I haven't ramped that up and trained that, then that's something I need to focus on because some people will go and, you know, do a bicep curl and their lats will turn off, their abs will turn off because all the tension is just going to that one point. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's, there's a lot of good things in there. And uh, I think to, uh, pull it back a little bit. I think when we, we talk about these things, it's easy for people that have been in pain and been injured to, to know like, okay, I can't get away with doing these things. Yes. The, the nursing home and out the nursing home reference and these different things, I get the sustainability the longevity point, but there's a lot of people that are maybe younger working out and they've gotten away with some of these bad mechanics for their whole life pretty much. And they're not experiencing any significant pain or injury and they might even be staying relatively fit. How do we sell that side of, of this. Cause there's, there's a lot of benefit for if you're recovering from an injury or, or have overuse things, this is a hundred percent for you, but this is a hundred percent for the people looking for performance as well. So how do we, how, how do you sell that to people that maybe they have some minor nagging injuries or they don't really see the importance in the longevity piece. They're like, Hey, I want to get fit. I want to get strong. I want to look good. How are you coaching people through that and, and getting them to buy into this concept? 
Yeah, so I've worked with a few f- physique athletes, uh, you know, especially in the female. And, you know, it's, it's kind of funny when you look at uh, what most, you know, women do in the gym. You know, it's about glutes. It's about, you know, abs. It's about all those things. But if you look at how people, and it, when you observe, if you understand the mechanics, so where we need to be at, but then where, what people default to just in general, like when you see a lot of people train and that's what helps with, you know, going into a gym, you're like, wow, I see how a lot of people do it wrong. Um, but they want to work on glutes. Well, they don't have the proper setup. So when I, I had a girl come in, she was, I mean, I, I, I don't forgot her starting body comp, but she was lean, um, fit and, we actually started just in the same way. And again, it's, it's one or two sessions. It's not like, Hey, we're going to start in this really, you know, remedial entry level vein, but we're just going to make sure I want to check the boxes and make sure, Hey, you have good positional awareness. You understand your nervous system and you have some stability as you start to pattern through some of these movements. So if we're looking at good hip extension, you know, we, a lot of times we default and be like, Oh, glute bridge. Oh, there's a lot of detail to a glute bridge because if we're looking at a squat, you know, in that glute bridge, I'm not just trying to bridge the hips up. I want to maybe put you in a position where you could activate your lats. You have to get high tension load through your abs and now extend your hips. Because what can happen is if this person doesn't put all those things together on the floor, they get up, they get a, you know, in a squat pattern, a deadlift or whatever, and they start to put that tension load through their body. Um, all of a sudden there's a default their hips go, you know, they could, you know, go into a lower dose in their lumbar, they're, you know, they're not going to be positioned. So, and again, genetics plays a big part with that. You know, some people can buffer things better than others. Um, and, and, or there's a little something, Hey, I've had a little bit of things. Well, we're going to address that. And if it shows up, but then do you get better activation? So if you want those glutes, if you're defaulting in a little bit of anterior tilt, as you, you know, and if you can't keep full of hip extension and keep your abs on, you're not going to get the best glute contraction. So we know that. So, Hey, let's, let's touch on that. Let's just hone that in. And the, this one example, the first session, she was so sore in her glutes and we didn't get off the floor because she wasn't actually accessing her glutes the way she, she thought she was. Um, and it's just, you know, that, and then that alone was, she was bought in. You know, so again, it's, it, there's always intensity. See, that's the problem is we think that exercises should dictate, dictate intensity. Well, I have to do some high, you know, global movement, a snatch or whatever to create intensity. No, that goes back to the nervous system. I could sit on the floor, I could lie on the floor and now it's up to me to build more tension. You know, when it comes to core exercises, I don't necessarily need to, you know, add a med ball and add all this stuff. I can actually start to internalize that. And that's the first part of training too, is a lot of times we don't internalize load. We wait for external load for us to engage. And that's the wrong, you know, the the best in the world know how to internalize load. Then when they go to pick up a barbell, when they go to do a, a, some type of lift that now they can express force and then build off that. And then the external load can then feed more internal pressure to then lift heavier or, or, you know, have better mechanics. Um, and again, that's something that we want to train. So that's what, you know, I really honed down is like, Hey, you know, somebody comes even, even somebody that hasn't trained in it coming from physical therapy, we need to ramp tension. You know, if you're coming from a knee surgery and I'm just trying to have you do a glute bridge, but you're still getting a little bit of sensation of pain in the left leg. Yeah. Because you're not building enough stability in your trunk and you're not getting full body tension. Um, and we know if you need that at the squat, so why wouldn't I start to teach that whole aspect on the ground? And I think showing people is, is so huge to be able to take them through that because people don't, I feel like a lot of people have a hard time connecting the dots of how much everything is a full body movement. And this tension thing we're talking about is we have to be creating tension throughout our whole system, through the core, through the upper body, through the lower body, whether it's pull up or a push up, whether it's a bench press, whether it's a squat, we think we, we think too much in isolation sometimes like, well, squat's going to work my quads and glutes and bench. I'm working my chest. And, and some people don't even realize how much the lats play a role in something like the bench. They, it's easy to com- compartmentalize some of these different things of, I want to train my back. So I'm going to do a pull down and pull ups and I want to train my chest. So I'm going to do bench. But if we're training properly, all these things are so intertwined and if we fail to see that we're going to either set ourselves up for injury because joints, joints can get stressed very improperly, or we're going to limit our performance. If we, we see people all the time that they can deadlift maybe say 315, but 
they can't create tension properly in a deadlift at 135 in good position. And these are things that get hidden when we focus too much on load. And I think some of this comes back to the maturity principle that we were talking about earlier too, of how do we, how do we move from focusing so much on what, cause the nervous system is less tangible, less objective of a, of a thing. And I agree completely the, the importance of training it because we see it time and time again, but how do we move from objective? Okay. I'm focused on how much weight I'm moving or, or how this is going to, cause the nervous system, like you said, that's, that's a little more ambiguous. It's a little more, okay. I don't know if I got better today. Did I create more tension for someone that isn't working with a coach? How do they kind of objectify some of these things? Or do you have any, uh, any thoughts on how to shift from how much load we're moving to how am I training my nervous system? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And, uh, where I've taken it is body weight training. You will learn how to engage your whole body. If you start to learn kind of some calisthenic work, uh, because you have to, your whole body becomes, you know, the progressions to calisthenics is short lever to long lever. Um, and your whole body has to stay connected, you know, and it really, you know, if you look at what you need to do in a bench press, and how you need to engage your lats, like the bit, you know, the best bench pressers in the world, know lats and triceps, you know, they're not worried about pecs. Pecs will come, you know, that's the thing is, is those will be defined over time with, because for one, your physique, when you really focus on lats and triceps, if you look at what happens to your thoracic positioning and the chest position, that's a really good posture. Okay. So your chest starts to lift. And then, yeah, you can throw in some bodybuilding stuff. You could throw in some chest flies, but you don't neglect that position. You know, you don't have any anterior glide of the shoulder um, and you don't lose that posture. Um, but going back to the calisthenics, if I do a simple, you know, pro pose, for example, you know, that's just a hand balancing. So you see that stuff in yoga and things like that. But, you know, there should be a, I, I have, you know, guys that, you know, hey, they can bench press whatever, but they can't even just balance their body weight with their with their hands and but you're using your lats you're going to find your you know this, this goes back and we'll touch on the prime muscles first secondary muscles you really have to tie into those primary muscles if you're relying on your secondary muscles you're not going to be able to hold it um you know but looking at a pistol squat you have to learn how to position your body and create tension throughout to get to the bottom and have enough strength to come up Okay. And because you're not relying on that, on that external force, if that makes sense. Cause if I'm always relying on the external force, I've never internalized that. So I feel like, yeah, for, so for somebody that pistol squats and they could have a weight, you know, it's a really a default that, you know, that's actually a, a helper with a little bit of weight because it could be a, a helping a restriction of mobility, or it could just be, Hey, I need this little bit of weight to help activate my, my core, my pelvic floor. Um, that helps me get up on the ground. And that's okay, but eventually the really good assessment is, hey, can you do it now with nothing? You know, can you get into some of these positions and, and, and hold? And that's, that's one place. The other thing too is, is just me, because a lot of times it's hands-on training, is giving people feedback. You know, so you're gonna push into something, I'm gonna put a block between your knees, you know, so you have to start to radiate tension through the whole body. And that, you know, that irradiation through the whole body is what we're, we're looking for. So there's a lot of hands-on stuff you know, that, that happens again, if you're doing stuff digitally or, you know, virtually it's kind of tough, uh, especially in context of what's got, been going on, but, um, you know, hands-on will determine that. Um, um, and you can kind of tell if somebody is giving you that pressure. Um, and that, that, that's key. Even when somebody's starting off with, you know, the first thing when squatting, like goblet squats, if you're familiar with, you know, the goblet squat and, you know, where the, where the weight's in front, usually with a kettlebell, um, I use my hand. So when somebody, instead of using any weight, they have to push. So just like they had the kettlebell, but they're pushing up into my hand. And if I feel, and what happens a lot of times, they can keep pressure at the top, but as they go down and as the complexity of that movement through the hips, their spine and their trunk, a lot of times the pressure turns off. And that's where you'll see, you'll start to see stuff happen at their low back, their lumbar, you'll start to see a, a collapse in pressure at the hips. So they're not abducting uh, anymore or actually rotating at the hip. You'll see the knees start to collapse in and that lack of pressure. So we have to kind of work through that. And if I didn't get my hands on or not kind of see where that sticking point is, and as a coach, that's the detail. And that's the finite stuff that I said before in the intro about, you know, we have to give a different value. And, you know, at a certain price point, I have to give the details of a high level coach. I can't just 
oh, here's another squat. No, I'm looking at this and now all of a sudden somebody starts, and that's really what we, you know, how we change movement and then giving somebody more feedback, more feedback. So if it's posture related, when they get done with that exercise, wow, they stand up taller, they will walk around with a different presence. You know, um, I'm working with a lot of younger athletes right now and uh, they walk in and today's world of, you know, texting and uh, video games and everything else, I go, I, the first question is, where do you want to go with your athletics? And hey, I want to be a D1 athlete. That's my one thing. I go, well, you're going to have to look like a D1 athlete first. Okay. And, and that posture will start to change a presence and even how they do their athletic drills, their warm up drills. And the biggest thing I tell the teams and coaches and things like that is when they're looking across the field and they see athletes with posture and positioning and a structure, like that's intimidation. Um, but that goes across the board with, you know, um, you know, that 45 year old woman client that, you know, is just trying to get fit. Posture is, is a big piece of that, you know, but that's neural tone. Um, and that's the feedback. Um, and that's what we want to, that's what we try to address. Yeah, I think that's perfect. The the posture is what a lot of people, they might not realize they're after it, but posture is if we're training for aesthetics, that's posture. If we're training for, hey, I want to just be healthy, strong joints, that's posture. The more we can pull ourselves into a good posture, the better we're going to feel, the better we're going to look. And that's what a lot of a lot of us and probably a lot of people listening are after anyways at the, at the core of it. They want to look good. They want to feel good. They want to be able to sustain it for a lot of years to come. Now we talked, we talked some on, we touched a little bit on the primary versus secondary muscles and, and, and turning the dial, I think are two important pieces that want to dive a little deeper into because a lot of people think they want to improve their posture. So they just do a lot of rows or they do a lot of uh, pull downs or, or, you know, our PT stuff, our T's, our Y's are things that are going to supposedly work our posture muscles, but there's a lot more to it than simply targeting an area in the middle of our back to pull our shoulders back. This, this is a full body thing that involves our glutes and our core and so many other muscles. So can you, can you talk a little deeper on, I know we, we briefly touched on the primary versus secondary muscles here, but the importance of those roles in our posture and how we look and how we feel and how it's so much more than just maybe doing more rows or more back exercises or something like that. Yeah. So I think, you know, that, it's an important point. Um, to understand those, you know, and uh, um, because our typically our poor posture or just how our, our world set up today with more sitting and things like that, they kind of feed into those secondary muscles. You know, they feed into kind of that forward shoulder position, slight kyphosis. So it's easy to kind of fault into, you know, using pecs, uh, biceps, um, you know, um, having hip flexors as a as a as a core muscle versus really using, you know, my transverse abdominus. So really the, the, the kind of, for those that are listening, kind of understanding primary muscles, you know, the three major primary muscles of the body uh, when it comes to, so you have glutes, okay? You have your transverse abdominus, okay? Most people rely on the rec, they're, they're training their outer, their, their six pack abs, but it's the TVA that's really going to express and it's always inner and then outer. And most of the time we're so focused on, you know, I've been working with gymnasts and they rely, it's just position. They're just focused on a position, but they are, they're not really understanding how to get to that position. They just see it and a coach may be demonstrated. It's so like, Oh, there's the shape, but it's like, Hey, what are you, there's some other stuff that I'm doing. You know, I talk with athletes too about how you stretch. Well, when you stretch your quad, you usually t grab the back of your leg, you know, you pull your, you know, your quad, but that's the position that's not how you stretch your quad. How to stretch your quad is I need to actually get my pelvis to, you know, posterior tilt. So I need to activate my glutes. I need to pull my abs in. Um, and that will then in turn with some pressure, stretch your quad. Um, so we, we can't just, you know, look at um, cert certain, certain positions, but, you know, glutes, transverse abdominis and lats. Okay, when we talk about posture, a lot of people, I mean, because if their shoulders are rounded forward, the first thing you do is try to squeeze their shoulder blades back. So we got, you know, all activate our rhomboids, and, and that's important, in our low, but that's not the main, those are not, those are secondary muscles. Um, and then they try to, and a lot of times they seam across their thoracic and they try to arch their back. And that's a natural default, which then on the opposite kind of anterior tilts their pelvis, which throws 
tension across your your hip line, your hip flexor, your quad, um, which takes away pressure off the or takes away from the glute. So you kind of have this this misnamed. So instead of you know trying to squeeze your shoulders back, try to reach your arms long. So you're reaching for your knees, and that sets the shoulders naturally into the pocket, and you start to feel your lats, which is going to then naturally lift the chest. But you can keep your rib cage down and stay in a more neutral spine position that you can have really good ab recruitment. Okay, and then that's the thing is you know going through Pilates and understanding really what Pilates is, um, understanding what gymnastics is because that's where when you look at a lot of core exercises, that's where they come from. They've just been dumbed down and just been thrown into you know something where a lot of times this core exercise that you get from a program is a more advanced Pilates exercise or gymnastics exercise. And that's why it could be leading to pain or might not be right for that person because this gymnast has worked through or this person in Pilates has matured and grown through and learned how to articulate their spine, learned how to create pressure in their transverse abdominis. Now to then articulate and move into and really engage their six pack abs. Um, because you want to, again, it always is about creating good mobility as well as then the function and the performance and the, uh, the cosmetic piece. But I can't take away the first part, you know. Um, so those primary muscles um, and those three are huge. And every exercise should, you know, do that. I teach people how to do a bicep curl. Um, and I use bicep curls a lot because what it does is if you really understand setup and engaging all that, it really sets the vertical plank. So if I set somebody up uh, in that plank posture, okay, vertically, and if we engage those three primary muscles, okay, and they're going to, and if they lean into it a little bit, so if you Pilates, there's a Pilates stance and typically your heels are together at the bottom to create adductor, you know, tension all the way up the glutes, you set your pelvis back, you scoop your abs, so you're drawn in and up because that articulates the spine. We don't draw in, and that's the common thing. I think that's where it's got wrong in the, in the strength world and things like that is like, Oh, I'll draw your abs in. Well, no, because then, you know, you're trying to brace. So I draw in and up to elongate. Now I brace. Okay. And I have to have the inner before I do the outer. All right. Uh, and then once I do that, I find my lats and now I do my bicep curl because the more most important piece to that is the pull up. Okay. Cause that's the big bang. Like we want to get there. Well, I need my biceps to work with all three other pieces because at the top you know, I don't use my biceps to do the pull-up. I use my biceps to finish the pull-up. So to really pull me into the bar at the, at the end to really get my chest technically or, you know, really low pull-up or a high pull-up, um, I need to get my biceps to recruit with my lats, with my core, with my glutes. Um, so we're, I'm, I'm focused not on the biceps but on how the setup is. And you're going to find your glutes and your abs because if your lats are engaged, your arms are slightly forward in front of you and you have now whatever weight it is, it's in front of you. Um, and that's a huge piece that goes back to how gyms are set up, you know? So if somebody doesn't have those skills yet, this is all skill-based. Somebody doesn't have those skills. That's why they, that's why there's a machine, you know? So there's a, there's a preacher curl machine and I could get on that machine and I could put my arms over that. But if I follow that step process, you know, I can't really engage my glutes because I'm in my hip flex position, but I'm going to engage my abs the same way. And now I'm going to drive my, the back of my arms with my lats and then do the bicep curl. You might not be able to do as much weight, but the recruitment in your bicep is going to be tenfold. What most people do is they just let that forward shoulder posture. They have that rounding in the back and they're slumped over uh, the vein and they're, and they're curling at the biceps. That's not going to lead to anything. It, you might feel a little bit in your biceps. It didn't affect your posture. You're not going to, and that's why most people, if they can even get a pull up, they can only get to the pull up to their chin. And that's not a pull up. We have to understand what the definition, and this goes back to the definitions, what is a pull up? Your chest, because we need thoracic extension, you need full shoulder retraction, depression um, in the shoulder position. The bar should go to your chest, high chest. If it doesn't get there, you're not doing a full pull up, technically. So that goes back to, can I do smaller variations? Yeah, I can. But am I over the process? Because again, this should be a process. You're talking about the long game. Um, you know, over time, it should get me there. So I should get closer. So if after a year of training or in the gym, like, wow, my pull-ups are getting deeper, you know, and I'm going to engage my lats. My posture is getting better. 
you know, you see the, 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 you know, people that do it right. You're like, Oh wow, they look different. You know, and a lot of times I don't even, you know, they could have, you know, a sweatshirt on and you're like, man, that guy's got a good physique because his posture, you know? Um, and that, and that, that's a key, key piece. Yeah. There's so many great things in that. I think for people listening the if you're feeling a little overwhelmed on where to start making these full body or making these exercises that you might see as isolation exercises should be full body exercises. And that gets into like Drew's saying, how we're, how we're setting up what we're engaging our nervous system, how we're putting these pieces together, because in the short term, it's going to be frustrating in some ways because you're not going to be able to move as much weight. It's, it's going to feel like you're not moving as much weight, but the effectiveness of the exercise, like you said, too, will be tenfold. You'll leave feeling torched in both your biceps and your lats and your, you'll be like, why is my core so fatigued from doing a, a bicep curl? If you're doing these things, these things, right. And these are, these are common mistakes we see. So can you talk through some, uh, I know you mentioned some of the setup things with, for the bicep curl, for example, squeezing the heels together. Can you maybe if we talk like squat and push up of, of some setup cues that people can use to try and create this full body tension and, and maybe so they can start to piece together some of the, the puzzle of, of what that even looks like in the gym. Yeah. So that brings a good point up because, you know, most people, you know, I know the gym, the gym is a catalyst to something bigger. You know, people are trying to, usually it's physique like, Hey, I want to, you know, have six pack abs, you know, necessarily not necessarily looking for performance. It's more if they are looking for a weight number on a bar or whatever, that's really an ego thing. Like, Hey, I want to make sure I could bench 225 because, you know, Joe next to me, you know, so I want to make sure that I can, or I can out rep him. You know, a lot of times it's the, it's the bro show. Um, but, uh, so they're looking for this physique. They're looking for this thing and it's almost like, Hey, or they want to be more athletic. Well, athletes know, you know, and how they train in the physicality that they need, you know, this full body tension. Okay. They, they express that. And the biggest thing with that is a response, not just physically, mentally, but hormonally, like hormones change when you, you know, that's why they say, Oh, you gotta, you gotta deadlift, you know, so many times a week or squat to get that high tension load. Well, why can't you train like that every single time? And for one, I don't have to train as much technically then I don't have to do like the one thing with deadlifting to get better at deadlifting. Yeah. There's a skill level to that. But the biggest thing why most people just continue to deadlift a lot is because that that's the only time they're getting high tension load. You know, they're like, okay, you know, so that's the only time I'm really feeling really resistance or really challenged. And it's like, no, you know, and so looking at most function, I had a guy come in and I was taking him through an assessment. He was, uh, he was in the army and he want, he, he wanted to be an army ranger. And, you know, so he was, you know, I asked him his program and it almost looked like a bodybuilding type program. I'm like, how many times do you bench press and, you know, you know, in, in, special force training to, to become an army ranger, you know? Uh, and he's like, you know, not that much. Um, I go, well, what's your, how many one arm pushups can you do? And he kind of looks at me and he's like, oh, I don't think I could do one. And I'm like, well, wouldn't that suit you? Because if I could do a one arm pushup, guess what my regular pushups would look like? Cause I guarantee, you know, you're going to do in, in, in special force, you do a lot of calisthenics. You do a lot of things. Um, so again, he was doing something that he thought he needed to do but he really didn't, you know, and he didn't know how to create full body tension. He didn't know how to express himself as an athlete. And that was possibly because he kept on getting injured too. And, you know, a lot of times we're focused so much on, you know, something we think we need. And so, so going, sorry, I think I, I got off on a little, uh, little tangent there. Um, but the setup of like a squat for one, you know, do we understand what a squat is? You know, the f perfect definition of a squat is a pelvis between heels. Okay. That will allow me to, you know, go to the floor and, and sit for a while. So if I, you know, if I watch, you know, an 80 year old man in Japan, he gets sit down and, you know, and sit there and, you know, forever. Um, but if I look at somebody that's going to squat overhead, their pelvis has to go be, be, they have to stack their body line to get a, to keep a barbell overhead. Their butt can't be two feet behind them when they, you know, and a lot of people are taking a positional awareness. They don't understand the squat. So they're, they're trying to, you know, overhead squat, but they're back squatting the overhead squat, if that makes sense. So it's understanding that. Um, 
but the feet position too. So the feet would be the first part you start. That's, you know, um, and this goes back. I, I know that you wanted to touch a little bit on r like runners and things like that, but the weakness in, in feet, the lower limb, you know, we understand hands. So if I have, if I'm going to, you know, do pull-ups, I better have strong hands, you know? So if I'm going to do how many pull-ups, well, can I hang from a bar for 30 seconds? Can I hang from a bar for 60 seconds? Is it active or passive? You know, we have all of these different things. And then what am I, how am I hanging? You know, am I hanging on by my fingertips or can I keep a good, you know, wrist position um, and good, you know, knuckle control and knuckles up to the ceiling, you know, position um, and maintain that. If I can't, then I'm not ready. Same thing with the foot, you know, how much control do you have with your foot? How much, what's your balance like? You know, if, if that's your limitation, yeah, that even a two-legged squat might be limited because of lack of arch control. Okay, so that's intrinsic foot positioning. And then pelvic position because of lack of core control. The, the, technically, the pelvis and your glutes set up your arch. Your foot maintains your arch. And a lot of times we get, it, we get that wrong, you know. Um, so once I have those, and I have to be able to keep that tension. From there, now breathing. Breathing's a big piece. You know, if I train a, a, a female client that has never gone through any type of really, you know, intense training, I need to teach her the same principles that I'm, than that power lifter that's lifting 500 pounds. She needs to breathe with an expression. She needs to, you know, engage these different pieces. And again, it might be just for a goblet squat. Um, but again, though, there's a posture and a tone. So when I look at somebody, it's like, oh, wow, she looks strong. You know, even if somebody does a body weight squat, are they expressing movement? I assess athletes coming in and the first thing I do is a simple screen. I don't even get in too detailed of what it is, um, but let me see a squat because they're squatting, they're doing workouts and you should express good movement. Like, oh wow, this kid looks strong. I don't need to take him to the barbell. The barbell is just, yeah, an expression of what he could do. So that's really, you know, for one, does he have the competency, the understanding and the skill level? And that's the first thing I test, you know, because if you're doing it, if you, you know, then you should express it. And then the capacity, the barbell would be the capacity. Okay. Let's see where you could go from it. You know, if that's endurance, if it's volume, if it's, you know, power strength. Um, and a lot of times we don't, that goes back to the definition. So we don't have the right, right setup. I think the biggest thing is the plank. The plank is, you know, because that everything stems from the plank because if we don't have good control, because if I was going to do a, a goblet squat, I have to start in the plank vertically. You know, my lats have to be on, my rib cage is down, my abs are on, my glutes are on, I have good quad tension. So my body, we have that joint centration, we're centering our, our, our stacking our body so I could take load on. Most people shouldn't be barbell squatting. Probably, you know, I would put it, unless you're, you know, been under the bar and understand these mechanics, do not touch a barbell. You're going to do more at first, you know, and that can be, might be a process within, and again, this should be a journey. It might be just a month. It might be 30 days, you know? And most people, it's like, they can't wait that long. It's like 30 days. <laughs> you know, if I tell you in a year from now, you can be in a whole different place. Like say you were squatting. I take you away for a little bit. For 30 days, we work on something. We learn on some of these skills and you come back. And then a year from now, less pain, more mobility, and you're stronger. And you might learn something different about yourself. You know, most people are not learning. They're just kind of, absorbing stuff you know that's the day and age of uh, social media and everything else i'm just getting shoved with stuff instead of like hey let me step back and how am i thinking through this what am i learning from this um which is the big part of the game you know we understand that it's a you know training working out is a active meditation you know am i present in the moment do i understand where i'm at do i have good breath control you know um, and what's taken away from that a lot of times is, is, you know, music, headphones, we're listening to stuff. So again, we're trying to get our mind somewhere else and we're just oblivious in space and just kind of like, kind of going through the motions. And, you know, so there's, there's a really way to tie into so like yoga and some of these other practices, um, in the sense of just the mental space, not that we have to, you know, be in this, you know, but am I present in the moment? Can I, you know, the best in the world, if I'm LeBron James, I can slow it down in the fourth quarter at the free throw line with everything going on and make a free throw. It's the same thing. If I'm going to get under a barbell and I'm going to squat a certain weight or, or do whatever I'm going to do. And I'm going to, I'll be able to control my abs, control my hips, control my feet 
as I'm lowering down with this load, okay? And if I'm not, then I have to, you know, self-evaluate that or I have a coach that tells me that and says, hey, let's take a step back for a second. And again, we can make, you know, steps forward then. But a lot of times we're not making those steps forward because we're not looking at those little, the little details. This, yeah, so many good things there. I want to, I would like to circle back on. I know we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but I like the, this, this idea of stepping back to take some bounds forward because a lot of times there's, and cause this is touching on physical stuff and psychological, mental, emotional stuff. Cause we don't realize how much these things are, are layered into our, our training. And for a lot of people it's, we train for physical things, but when we can use this as a lot of people, it's used as meditation, it's used as an outlet, it's used as these other things. So I think there is this fear to step back even for, like you said, a week or 30 days or something. It's like, well, what if I, I'm used to back squatting. I've back squatted for the past five years. What would happen if I took that out? And, and I think there's some resistance to that. And I don't know. And I, I know for myself, it's, it's hard because I identify a lot with the weight being moved and that's where you feel accomplished, but being able to have the maturity to step back and regress and maybe sacrifice how our numbers look, how these things can set us up for such long-term success. How, how do you recommend people starting if someone has been, and we see a lot of people that have been crossfitting for years, have been in the group gym for years or power lifters for a long time. And that, that's a hard conversation to have for someone who's, who's attached to those, those things. How do you recommend going about starting for someone who's, we'll, we'll stay on the back squat example, someone who's barbell back squatted for five years, almost consecutively, probably had some injury setbacks and been forced to be out of it. But when they've been able to, they've been back squatting. What does that look like to step back and what are they training in, in place of maybe loading under the barbell? Yeah. So, you know, the biggest thing, most people train for ego and based off of fear. Okay. Um, you know, they're fearful, you know, runners run a lot of times because they're fearful that they're going to gain weight because they can't control their diet. Um, they can't control these other values. So they think by just, you know, burning calories that they're going to, you know, that's going to get in there. The ego part in the gym is like, Hey, that's my identity. And a lot, and I see it all the time is identity is based off of, you know, what people do in the gym. Um, and if that's where your identity is, then, you know, that's kind of a, I would hate to say a sad point. Um, the other question is, is, you know, where has that got you right now? Are you at a better place for back squatting for the last five years? And I'm not anti back squats. I just look at majority of people out there have not dialed in the details then to be able to back squat with quality and then longevity and then actually really put some numbers down. You know, like again, if looking at somebody's weight, you know, you see a big guy in the gym, well, he should have a big back squat. Okay. Cause your weight is determined off of your thing. If you're a big guy, you should have a big bench press. Okay. If not, you know, if you're 250 and your bench press is 315 or you're, that's not really good. I'm sorry to say. Um, and you see that a lot. You'll see the guy because nobody else is really, there's not that many guys that are bench pressing 315. So they feel, Oh, but if you look at their mechanics, you look at it, Wow. You're leaving so much on the table. And to tell that person to, to kind of take a step back, that's his identity at the gym. That's why he goes there. And there's nothing wrong with that, but hopefully your identity starts to dive into something else. And this is maturity. This is going back to something more rooted in place. You know what I mean? You know, my identity is not based off my training. You know, hopefully it's, you know, something deeper than that. You know, um, if you have family, if you have other things, and then this is secondary. And again, that's a, that's a course of time that I've matured through over the time, but those are conversations. Who's going to have those conversations? Well, that takes another mature person to even have those, you know, um, and to really self, you know, evaluate. Um, so, I, you know, it, it's really hard. Every case is going to be completely different, um, you know, where they go. And again, maybe it's frequency, maybe, you know, I think what most people miss is that intensity. So, yeah, that's the only place where they're getting the intensity is that back squat maybe. Um, and if you start to do these other things, you're like, oh, wow, I, I don't see it like I'm going back to it as much because I feel that intensity in so many other places. Does that make sense? And I think that's where um, um, somebody can go is if they have not feeling intensity. You know, I see most people, you know, you see the guys bench pressing and their last rep, the, 
the right leg kicks up. It's like, wait, you're not creating any tension through your body. So they're not taking the principle of what they should be doing in a back squat or a deadlift uh, or a plank or any of those other things and then take it into the bench press. They're losing all of that. And if they're doing it in the bench press, I guarantee they're not doing anything else either. Yeah, that's a, a, I love what you're saying too about the ego, fear, and identity for why we train and, and sometimes for the wrong reasons. And uh, not that not that those can't be good motivators to, to get healthy and get fit, but being able to separate from that. And I'm sure we could have a whole separate podcast on, on that topic is a, there's a lot more involved in something like that, but being able to step back physically and change the, change the intensity stimulus. A lot of times what we see is that people end up doing much better when we put them back in a back squat. And I know that's something that we've kind of been hinting at throughout it. And, but by being able to create this tension, there's this, you know, what the heck effect of that we, we go from not training a pull-up in two months and then we get someone on a pull-up bar, but we taught them how to better use their lats and a plank and better use their glutes and their core. And all of a sudden they're like, I have more pull-ups than I've ever been able to do, been able to do versus just trying to maybe do band or assisted pull-ups and just try and force feed, force feed those reps. So I think, and I'm, I'm sure you have plenty of stories personally and, and with your clients of seeing, have you seen them, the people that are set on pushing numbers of these things, have you been able to take them away and see people get back to higher levels of performance as well? Oh yeah. You know, every training, and this goes back to that, you know, training in that context of nervous system, connective tissue, and then muscles, everything should lead in the same direction. Okay. So if I'm, you know, I don't need to, again, it goes back to specific skills of the movement capacity when it comes to like a barbell squat, you know, there's a skill level with that and understanding mechanics. But a lot of times we could take a step back if somebody has the skill and then we could be training most of the time it's creating more high tension load, learning how to stabilize their trunk better, learning how to then flex the knee. All right. Well, that might be a higher tension, you know, hamstring exercise. So it might be, you know, Nordic curl, for example, is a great body weight exercise. So going back to learning how to control body weight with a high tension demand across the hamstring, you know, will then change. You come back and then do their squat and you're like, oh, wow, the squat. And it's all perspective too. Most people are not, you know, again, if a lot of times we're just hanging out. So we put a bar on the back. We're kind of hanging out there, you know, where all of a sudden now you take an exercise and that person, you know, that's doing that back squat. Well, let's take two kettlebells. You know, if you're a pretty strong guy, let's take two kettlebells. You know, if you take even two 24 kilos, but go up from there, 28s, 32s, and do some front squats, you'll respect it really quick. You go back to a back squat, you're like, oh. All right, this is, you know what I mean? So, and it really has, so that ab and what you're going to feel in your abs when you do that front squat with those kettlebells. Now, if you could connect the dots and if, again, if it's that, you know, internal process, hey, can I internalize? And okay, that feeling that I feel, I need to have that same feeling when I back squat. But that's an internal because that, feed, that barbell is not going to give you the feedback like those kettlebells did. So the process, do I, can I get the takeover or can I get, can I, can I take that to the next exercise? And sometimes that's the skill level. Like one thing will give us because it's, it's definitely going to give us feedback because of the weight in front, but now can I, you know, bite down on my abs and, and connect that internally when I'm doing that back squat and all of a sudden, wow, that just got, you know, I created strength, better positioning because if those abs connect the same way in a back squat, that you did with the front squat with the kettlebells, your depth, your range of motion, your stability from the, bo from the bottom up is going to be, you know, tenfold. So I, I think maybe using complementary exercises, I'm not telling you not to squat, we're just, you know, Hey, and if you're just back squatting all the time, you're not going to have these other feedback tools. You know, are you doing, are you having single leg days? You know, if I'm just doing bilateral work, I need to have that unilateral work because we talked about foot control. Your feet are working at a higher, you know, level when I'm doing single leg work. Um, and that, and that's, that's huge. Yeah. I think for people listening, that's two easy starting points of, of finding an exercise. That's, uh, if you're used to doing barbell stuff, something that's looks similar to it, a similar squat movement, but doing something that challenges your posture a little more like those, if you haven't tried double 
kettlebell front squats, you're going to feel like you're getting folded over and <laughs> you're going to find your shoulders rolling forward and, and find out how to use your, your core and, and some of those hip muscles a lot better. But like you were saying, go back to the squat then. And then we also see people reporting when we do that, they're like, wow, I feel, I feel my core working more. I, I actually feel my core. I feel my quads, my glutes, these things where, cause a lot of people, they do back squat and they're like, yeah, I feel str like I'm moving weight, but I don't really feel many muscles working. I kind of feel my low back a little achy when I'm done. My, my knees maybe a little bit, but they don't feel what it's like to really pull into a squat, to control a squat, to own a squat. And I think that's something that is missing for, for a lot of people is that, and that's what you're talking about, the internal triggers, the internal cues and feelings. Yeah, the, uh, you know, and that goes back to, you know, all this ties back into all the stuff that we talked, touched on, but the definition, you know, if I'm back squatting, and I need my shoulders to retract a little bit, I'm pulling down into the bar to engage my lats, I'm keeping good length through my spine, so a little bit of extension and things like that. When I do that, that bar, that uh, kettlebell squat, the double rack, I have to keep some of those same principles, not that I'm going to retract the same like with a barbell, but there's slight retraction the lats are engaged. Okay. And I'm keeping the same length. A lot of people grab barbell or the dump or sorry, the kettlebells and they have this, you know, protracted rounded upper back because the weight is just kind of diving them forward and they'll perform the squat, but it doesn't, it's not the same. You need to maintain. And that goes back to then, okay, I need to dial the weight back, you know? So that's where if you do it right, two twenty fours. I'm talking about kilos. So that's about 53 and a half pounds on each side for those that's a hundred pounds in front of you that, that will see where you're at, you know, especially if you keep good positioning through the body. And coming back to definitions, if your squat looks like a squat should too, and a lot of people can get in that double kilo position you touched on earlier, they, they back squat it, or they almost look like they're doing a low bar back squat with the kettlebells in front. Can you talk just briefly on the, the problems that can pose? Yeah. So, you know, again, a good definition, a squat, you know, your trunk and your tibia should be at the same line. So those should be, you know, parallel lines uh, as you go down. Um, and most people, you know, it's depending on restrictions, depending on how they've been taught, you know, a lot of times people shoot their hips back. Like the, the, the simple analogy is people say, well, squat back in a chair, you know. So then we have this hip position, but we continue to travel backwards and that's not good. Okay. The key thing is, is we want to, we want to get our upper body trunk to, or our body to hinge slightly at the start to load our posterior chain. So you, you load the glutes and hamstrings, but from there, now we descend straight down in, into the, into the hole. And that will allow that tibia and, and trunk line to be parallel. Um, and a lot of times, yeah, we'll get the hips shooting back or what will happen is, is the body will, uh, the upper body, this is another really common default or, or fault is the upper body will stay straight up and you will have somebody go straight down because the weight will kind of keep you upright. So you'll have this four and it's just all quad. You're not getting that hip, that hip to get into a, a good flex where the glutes can then now drive through. So you're going to get a lot of quad dominant. You're going to get a really far shearing position of the knees. Um, and again, some people can, I've, I've watched people and they can, they have really good mobility and they can buffer that. But that's not a really, it's not going to, that squat's not going to translate to a better back squat. Um, you know, um, so again, you really have to, there's, there's a lot of detail when it comes to movement. And it's so easy depending on where your maturity is, what you're lacking of where you're going to take your, your training or where you're going to take your movement. And sometimes you're not even aware of it, you know, and that's where you need to eye. All coaches need to die. Uh, but especially a student, if you're a student in the game, you need to kind of, you know, and then as you go through it, hopefully I can start to internalize that. I mean, that's why they have mirrors and gyms. It's not just to check my, <laughs> my physique out and wear a cutoff bro tanks and, and stuff like that. It's, you know, Hey, yeah, that's part of it. I could, I could, I'm not going to lie, but Hey, I can look at my positioning, you know, maybe I, yeah, if I'm max back squatting, I'm not going to side look to my, my squat and see if I'm in the right, you know, lumbar position. Okay. Or the great thing about technology is, and you see a lot of people, you know, they're posting on Instagram or whatever, but hey, I could do a little video really quick and have somebody video my squat. Let me see. Is, is, some, is stuff moving? You know, if I'm going down and I see my pelvis tuck under on my squat or I see my lumbar go into extension at a certain point, that shouldn't happen. And that's a simple, you know, flag that 
something else is going to, or you're going to hit a limitation and you're not going to be able to go any farther. Yeah. I think that's such a good point for anyone listening. I mean, finding a great coach is, is really invaluable, but if you don't have that, making sure you're recording some things, you're checking feedback, seeking feedback where you can, because the position doesn't, doesn't lie. Like we, some of it's internal and there's a big piece of being able to feel those things. But like, like Drew's been saying, if, if you, if you're doing this right and you're getting that better posture and you're getting pulled into these positions, it should reflect on when you see yourself on, on video, when you're reviewing form, when you're doing these things, if you're still finding your videos looking super rounded forward, then that gives you some cues or some things to, to start to work on. And it can be harder to find out, okay, where do I start? Because it is so complex of, do I need to work on mobility? Do I need to work on, do I need to regress or progress the exercise? Do it, there's a lot of things that we can look at, but you should see these general trends of working in the right direction if you're working on the right things. And that's a, an easy spot check, I think. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's apps out now that, you know, athletes are doing that a lot, you know, any, any golf pro, um, you know, they're, they're analyzing with some of these, these programs and things like that. Um, but you could simple, you know, even with uh, a simple, um, you know, most Apple products now you can draw on the screen, but you could draw at the bottom of your squat, you know, draw the line of your tibia, your lower leg and your trunk line and see what's the lineup. You know, if those, those lines are going to intersect, um, you got some angles that are off. You know, now it's different if depending on the squat, you know, you're going to, you know, in a normal squat, that's the positioning. But if it's a back squat, yeah, you're going to have a little bit more of a forward. It's going to look more like a deadlift. You know, you're going to have that kind of forward, maybe not as excessive, but um, it's going to change the angle a little bit. But if you're traditionally squatting or a front squat or anything like that, which is more of that traditional squat, overhead squat, um, those lines shouldn't connect. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And being able to have, at least start to educate, have a base understanding of what should look like what. And and that's again, circling back to our definitions of a, of a squat. If you know, you don't have to know all the mechanics of a, of a squat and the different variations, but you should know in general that an overhead squat should not look like your deadlift. And that's some simple things that if you're seeing, uh, starting to educate yourself and seeing where these differences are so that you're not mistaking a movement that you feel like you need to fit yourself into because you saw someone else performing at the gym, making sure you're not forcing yourself into a movement that isn't going to serve your body in the long term. Yeah. Most people deadlift their squat. It's super easy. It's easy to, you know, we sit in chairs, so we sit back in a chair. So we sit back in our squat, but we then we know we have a partial definition where, Hey, we should have our chest up. So now we go into this big extension position, um, which is going to cause a lot. And, you know, if you look at the statistics of low back pain and even with people that are fit or, or, or training, there's a huge, you know, I've dealt with it, you know, and that's, that's one of my biggest things is because you kind of fall into the, Hey, sit back, you know, in your squat, but then chest up, look up at, you know, the old cue looking up. Well, it's a cue. Yeah. For, you know, if you have 30 guys in a, in a weight room and kids are rolling bars over their back, you know, in the weight room, you got freshmen in high school kids. So it's like, Hey, look up. Well, yeah, the bars are not going to roll over their neck anymore, but it's not going to be good for their, for their mobility, for their low back. And then you keep that. And then, you know, you went through your, your, you know, football training or whatever. And now I'm 45 and I'm still doing that same technique. And, you know, where's that getting you right now? You know, that's a tough, tough place to be. Yeah. It's usually in the people we see it's, it's pain, it's achy joints, it's falling short of where they want to be at maybe physique wise, maybe weight loss wise, hitting these, these plateaus and are hitting these setbacks. So being able to reevaluate and again, having maturity and being able to step back. And that's either maturity of saying, Hey, my, my current program isn't, isn't serving me right now. I got to either take a step back or I need to find a coach or someone who knows how to uh, get me on the right track and, and give me some education of how to start to take, take control of, of reversing that process. Yeah. That's a great point. Yeah, man. So much good stuff here today. I, I, I love the I had a lot of other notes and things that wanted to get through, but only, only so much time to get, get through everything when, when yeah, we get sorry, together and, and start talking. No, I no, it's, be, I could be a long winded. So. <laughs> no, a lot of good stuff and uh, awesome health and fitness knowledge for anyone listening. Uh, great starting point for all this. And when we talked through though, as we transition here towards the end, when we talked, when I first approached you about being on here, I want this to be a podcast that's so much more about just the health and fitness side of things and the movement side of things. And well, that's, our focus and our, our future topic. There's so much more to, to our health and fitness and to our identity and to 
our egos and fears and some of those other things that we touched on even earlier in, in the show here today. And want this to be about something that is much more than that. Cause people see you on the outside and super fit dude, you have your family life together, you're training together, you're uh, able to juggle all these things. It's, it's easy to see from the outside, this, this, uh, vision of success and having it all together in these things. And I think for a lot of the men listening specifically, that can be a, a dangerous place to be for aspiring men to, to look from the outside, to look from the, the social media lens and be like, wow, everything's great. The beautiful family fit all these things together. And, and we both know that that's just not the case. And we'd, we'd both be the, the first to admit that our journeys have been tough and full of setbacks and full of these, these things. So I want it to be a, this a place where, we can be real as men and, and talk about some of the other struggles and challenges we faced out outside of, of health and fitness as well. So if you wouldn't mind being, being real with listeners, uh, what's a challenge you've faced in the past or something you're currently facing that's been a, a major catalyst for your, for your growth as a man? Um, I think the biggest thing is being selfish, you know, um, going back, you know, really starting my, fitness journey and like the physique piece of it, you know? So as I've matured over the years, um, but you know, I love training. I love to, you know, be outdoors. I like the mountain bike. I like to, you know, snowboard. I, I like to do all of those pieces. Well, that starts to change when you have a wife, when you have a kids, you know, uh, depending on, you know, where you live and logistically, well, I got to take more trips. If I, you know, I'm in the Midwest, I want to go out West to do these things. But even on the things, you know, I would like to spend more time training, but when you have work, when you have kids, you know, there's been several instances, you know, when I've, and what really started to change was, you know, if I don't have spending a lot of time with my kids, I would got up on a Sunday one morning and I was, I was working out, I have a side room and working out and the kids come downstairs and it was easy for me or it would, it could have been easy for me to just to close the door and for me to finish my workout. But I can't, you know, I have twin boys and, and to have them there and they would have probably never thought of it, but you know, we, I, there was a laundry basket sitting there. I picked up the laundry basket. I put both boys, they were probably both about 30 pounds at the time and they were having a blast, but I'm holding in front of me. I'm squatting. I was doing some other stuff. Uh, I was laying on the floor doing some lat pullovers, you know, with this thing. Um, and it actually wasn't that comfortable because if you ever hold a laundry basket, you know, this, the, the, the handles are about to break, you know, but they were having a blast. They were laughing, you know, they were getting it good. So I have to take my selfishness away uh, because I could have said, well, I'm trying to get this workout in that I have to like, you know, do these exercises. No, no, I'm get, I could put tension on. I feel good. I can go farther. And there's, there's always tomorrow, you know? Um, and I think that's, that's the key thing is, is, you know, family comes first before training. Um, but there, again, there's a level, you know, God, family, you know, going down the list, um, you know, it, it's, it's important to put those aspects in place. Um, and a lot of times it goes back to maturity. You know, if I'm being selfish, I'm not that mature then, you know, and I really, um, and I'm not being wise because, you know, where am I putting my, my fruit or where am I putting, you know, uh, my value? Um, and that's, that's wisdom, you know, and, and a lot of times we can be foolish uh, at a certain point and I could tell, and sometimes again, we got to be checked, you know, um, and sometimes we'll go through a little pain part or, you know, neglect, um, but we have to come back to that. Yeah. yeah so well said, I appreciate you sharing that. That's a, uh for reassurance, you're not the only one going through the selfishness with that. It's, it's, that's a hard, a hard line to, to follow. And it's, it's so easy to get caught up in today and what, well, like I had it in my plan to get, this is what I was going to get done today. And this was the perfect workout I wrote out, or, you know, we can use anything as an example, but being able to develop that maturity and wisdom, it, it doesn't come easy. It comes from learning the hard way often, but uh, we have something we can continue to strive for still. Yeah, I think the mental part of it, because, you know, what I thought in the past is I need to do this workout with all these sets, with all these exercises. And I was really training, you know, and I was training muscles. And now it's like, hey, I can actually put a short time in and but it's the intensity. And that's the mental piece is I could bring a high level game in a short amount of time and actually get a lot of benefit. Um, and again, though, but I've had to work through that and, you know, and to step away from those long workouts sometimes tough where, you know, that's what we think we need and, or we've been so used to. Um, 
And again, there's times where I have that, but not always. Yeah, it's, it's hard. It's hard when and it gets back to being in our own head. It can be a tough place to be and seeking feedback, whether that's from, and that can be feedback from family, from friends, from people we, we trust. It can be feedback from coaches. We need to have that accountability and that, like you said, check, check yourself sometimes too of, is this really what I need? We can't be afraid to reevaluate and nothing's going to, we're not, we're not going to lose everything in the next 30 days and we're not going to, we're not going to make huge strides in the next 30 days. So being able to step back for a little bit and reevaluate, okay, am I on the right track? Are there better ways I can be doing this and better ways in terms of our whole life and how we're structured, not just are there better ways in my health and fitness? Yeah. 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 Awesome, Drew. I want to want to kind of summarize some of our key points here. There's there's a lot of them, so I'll, I'll do my best here and see if there's anything you want to add. But I think one of the the big things. So first thing I highlighted is in taking notes as we were going here was that moving from training muscles to training our, our nervous system and the importance of making sure we're not reversing that process, making sure we're not getting too caught up in just going to the gym and training muscles. Uh, second thing, making every exercise a full body exercise so we can dial up the intensity through our nervous system and not through the exercise itself. If we feel like we need in our examples of a max back squat or deadlift to feel that full tension and intensity, there's probably other things that we're missing in some of our body weight training or other ways that we might be able to access that. And then the uh, last piece is seeking feedback. So whether that's from a coach, whether it's from ourself, video work, making sure that we're continuing to, evaluate both our, our programs, our movements, and some of those things where uh, there's a lot of potential for, for seeking some of that feedback and seeing improvement. So those were three of many things I jotted down there, Drew. Anything you want to add to that? Yeah, just, uh, you know, most of the things that you're, uh, you're doing stick away with those prime, prime muscles, lats, TBA, transverse abdominis, and uh, glutes. Um, you know, if you're doing a, you know, you see guys at the, or most people at the gym just to touch on this is say they're doing a tricep press down. A lot of times they're broken at the hip position, you know, they're hinged over, they're doing these exercises, you know, try to stay vertical and engage your glutes just like you would plank. So now I'm, I'm demonstrating my plank throughout my training. And again, your weight's going to go down. But the question is, what if your weight was the same and you were able to hold that body line? It's going to be night and day difference. And that's what I've saw with accessory work. So like if I do calisthenic work or get into some gymnastics training, well, if I'm going to do an arm day, why can't I basically tie those together? But if I take even the person that's not doing gymnastics training, could I get them closer to gymnastics training by doing just some simple tricep extent or, or straight arm pull downs, you know? Um, and a good way to start with that is just kneeling. You do a kneeling uh, cable lat pull down, but don't do it hinged at the hip, which majority of people do because they're worried about their lats. You do it in a vertical position, glutes, hip, full hip extension, good ab recruitment and lats engaged in a vertical position and you will find all of that and more. Um, and you're really testing that full body strength. You're going to test neural demand um, because it's easy to break. It's easy to, to drop posture. It's easy to break at the hip, extend your T-spine and you need to keep, you know, rib cage down and engage all that. So that's a, that's a huge piece. Yeah. It's so great. It comes back to our setup, comes back to being able to humble ourselves a little bit with, instead of going from 60 to 70, 70 pounds on a tricep extension, can we do the same amount of, of weight or even less weight more effectively and probably get better results with it? Yeah. And that's a huge piece to tie into. Like if you want to get your deadlift up, that exercise alone will, because you're tying in all those key pieces because to keep the bar connected in a vertical translation so it doesn't drift out in front of you, you better be keeping all of that connected. So it doesn't yes. always have to look what you think it needs to look. It doesn't have to be a dynamic work. It could be static stability and then you're doing maybe, you know, just moving your arms, but the rest of the body is getting that high, high load demand. Yeah. Just so many different ways to, to look at it. I think that's, again, if you can, if you can seek out a, a coach to be able to help you through some of these things, it's not always intuitive. If we assume I want to get a stronger deadlift, I should do more hinging and deadlift and kettlebell swings and things that look exactly like a deadlift when there's plenty of other, those carryover things that planks in some of these different positions and changing how you're kneeling rotational demands, all these things can, can have an impact on the deadlift itself. Yep. Yep. 
Awesome. Well, last thing here, our hypothetical scenario for you, Drew, uh, we're saying you're leaving your favorite coffee shop and you bump <laughs> into your younger self of 10 years back. So younger Drew 10 years ago, and he asks current Drew uh, for some life advice. He's looking for some direction. He wants to know more. You're on your way to a super important meeting though with your family. You only have 60 seconds to talk to him. What advice are you giving to him and what are you saying to him? Um, biggest thing is look at the original source. You know, a lot of times it's very easy to get the secondary, third, you know, person to, to basically stem information. You know, the one thing I, I look at is my faith based, um, you know, so if you go to a church and you constantly just listen to a preacher, you know, he's got his own interpretation, you know, um, and what's changed the, you know, how I look at a lot of things is, you know, wow, I went through, you know, uh, devotion of Luke or Acts and see how the first church came about or look at how Jesus, you know, talked and spoke and, and everything like that. And you're like, wait, this looks different. You know, you've, you've tried to consume, it's a consumer part where, you know, when Jesus spoke, not many people were around after there was a lot of people started and a lot of, and now, you know, in this church, so a lot of times we get tainted, but that goes across the board with anything. It goes in the fitness world where, Hey, let's look at the best in the world. And I want to go to that source. And there's, and that's the nice thing about, you know, digital platforms and, you know, you find out what are the best in flexibility and I can seek them out now and not even, and maybe pay a little bit of money or not even, and there's a lot of free content and really start to, you know, um, to look at those things. And that's really the, the key thing. And I think if you went there first, it would, it would, you know, funnel out. So, you know, these conversations can even funnel into, okay, let me seek out the best deadlifters. And, you know, because I guarantee they're doing some, they're not just deadlifting. They're going to cue that and, and teach you good form, but they're also like, Hey, these are what makes these guys the best. You know, I've done that with gymnastics. I've done that with flexibility and mobility training, you know, um, because you have to express all the way across. Um, I love it. It takes, it takes a little bit of work on, on your end though, to be able to yeah, things no. out and not just blindly consume. And it takes a little bit of work, a little bit of effort, but the, what you'll learn through it will be so much greater. Yeah. And that's the journey. That's the, uh, that's the wisdom um, that you come through and um, you'll hopefully be bit better on the other end. Yeah. Drew, this was awesome. I'm so excited for, for people to be able to listen to this. Uh, where can people reach out to you if they're looking to get a hold of you? Um, Drew Gallagher Fit Instagram. I really haven't posted too much, but you can contact me there or uh, I throw my email out. If anybody has any questions, I'm, you know, always uh, willing to help. That's one thing I love. I'm passionate about this. So Drew Gallagher dot fit at gmail.com. Um, I could get, get back to you. Cool. I'll put that in the show description for anyone looking to reach out to Drew. Awesome, Drew. Appreciate you coming on. This is so much fun and I uh, appreciate you taking some time. Thanks, Dave. It's been awesome.